I think family health as a paediatrician is obviously important, but it's very difficult because it's complex. And families, of course, are personal things, but they also affect the whole world. And there's a lot of politics, national politics. I'm going to talk mainly about vitamin D nutrition, which is something which I think is a very hot topic. It's a personal matter, but I'll, I'll tell you a lot about what's happening politically. As a doctor, I'm brought up as a scientist, um, but there's also the art of medicine, and I think family health generally involves a lot of art as much as science. There's a lot of known, and there are a lot of unknowns, and particularly in the field of vitamin D at the moment, I'm going to tell you some of the facts that we're certain about, but also raise a lot of questions about things which are unknown. One of the particularly difficult political questions at the moment for vitamin D is how should we give our children vitamins? And the NHS have healthy start vitamins, which have been not totally successful and quite controversial. Before I say any more, I should just declare my, my um, interests. Um, I work at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital, I'm employed there full time, but our hospital has formed a mission with commercial partners um, called the Vitamin D Mission, and I do quite a lot of work for them. I've also um, spoken on behalf of Internis, a, a company that make vitamin D as a drug, and they actually have a stand outside, um, and Consilient Health, which is another drug company. So, without further ado, I want to ask four, five questions about vitamin D. First, just to remind us, what is vitamin D? Particularly to focus on where do we get it from? That is the key question. And if you only remember one thing of what I say, I hope that will be clear where you get vitamin D from. What is happening at the moment? This year will be an exciting year in the world of vitamin D. Why do we need vitamin D? What's it do for us? And the bottom line is, who needs vitamin D? Which of us need it? Exactly how much do we need it? How often do we need it? So, what is vitamin D? All I'll say is it, it is a vitamin, or possibly better described as a hormone. It's a chemical that our bodies require in small amounts to keep us healthy. It has many different effects in the body, but um, without vitamin D, almost none of the organs in the body would be able to function. Where do we get it from? Would somebody like to shout out, where, where do you think we get vitamin D from? Thank you. And I usually say that if you have to think of seven reasons, seven places you get it from, the first six should be sun, 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 sun. <laughs> because that's the natural way to get vitamin D. And most of us get most of our vitamin D from sunshine. All the other vitamins you get in the diet, but you don't get much vitamin D in a natural diet. Really, the only foods that have a reasonable amount of vitamin D naturally are oily fish and eggs and mushrooms if they've been in the sun or they've been irradiated. There are a lot of foods that we can add vitamin D to, but in this country we don't fortify many foods yet. There is more fortification happening at the moment, but we don't fortify as much as, for instance, in North America where most of the milk is fortified with vitamin D. In this country, milk is not fortified unless it's special formula milk made for babies or children. So the crucial thing to remember is that you get vitamin D from the sun. And that is why in this country we have a problem. In the winter, even on a sunny day, you cannot form vitamin D in this country. In the summer, you could if you go out in the middle of the day and expose your skin. And you have fairly, if you have fairly light skin, like me, you can get a good dose of vitamin D in just a couple of minutes. If you have dark skin, you might need ten times as much time in the sun. So that's the one thing I would like you to remember. If you don't remember anything else, sunshine is the natural source of vitamin D. I just want to say something now about what's happening this year, um, some hot topics, and this is largely politics, I have to warn you. Let's start by just outlining some national guidelines that are emerging um, 
As a paediatrician, I'm very involved with the World College of, <coughs> Child, uh, World College of Paediatrics and Child Health, the RCPCH. There's an organization closely allied to that called the BPSU, which you may not have heard of, but every paediatrician in this country communicates with the BPSU every month. The BPSU is the British Paediatric Surveillance Unit, and they do a survey of rare diseases, and they are just about to start a survey of rickets in this country. That should go live within the next month or two, and that will continue for a year, and that will give us the best data on how many children actually get rickets in this country. That's a question which I'm asked very frequently, and we have some data to answer it, but the truth is, at the moment, we don't really know how many children get rickets. There is something, if there were dietitians here, I'm surprised there's not a single dietitian, but dietitians would be familiar with the NDNS, that's the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, I'll tell you something about mice, all of us in healthcare will know mice, stands for the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence, I don't know why there's no H in there, but that's mice. NOS is the National Osteoporosis Society, I'll tell you something about. And SACN is the big one. Again, dietitians will know about SACN. Does anyone here, anyone heard of SACN? SACN is the government committee <coughs> called the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. This is a very powerful committee that sets the national policy for food, which foods should we fortify, how much vitamin D, for instance, should we have in our food. That's second. I'll tell you something about that. And the other things happening this year, I think there'll be a, continue, a continuation of the explosion in research, in retail, how much vitamin D is sold on the market, and unfortunately, cases of rickets. So, just to put this in perspective, I'll, I'll go back a couple of years and just say that my college, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, started a campaign to improve children's vitamin D health at the end of 2012. The next year, 2013, the Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davis, published her report on the annual, her annual report on the nation's health, and she focused last year on children's health, and in particular, highlighted the need for vitamin D in our child population. Then, last year, in May, the NDNS, that national survey that I mentioned, published data on how much vitamin D we have in our diet in this country, and what blood level we have. Um, don't need to write this down. Um, we will circulate these slides with all the data and references. But in short, this shows that there's a large number of people with a low level of vitamin D. And then, when they talk about a low level, it's a significantly low level. If your blood test of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is less than 25 nanomoles per litre, that is low. And everyone will agree on that. There's a lot of controversy about what is a healthy level. 25 is certainly low. Most people in this country, such as myself, would say 50 is okay, but other experts say you need to be up above 75. That's a bit controversial, but there's no question that 25 is low, and there's no question from the national data that a large part of the population in all the different age groups are below that. And particularly in the winter, from January to March, 30% of adults and 40% of older adults and 40% of adults and teenagers are low. That's a large part of the population, 40% of us. And that's because right now, in March, we're at the end of the winter and we haven't, any sun exposure that we've had over the summer has left us. The vitamin D only lasts for a few months. We're now at rock bottom and before the spring starts, almost half the population are low. I mentioned mice. They published some national guidance at the end of last year, which is only starting to embed now. I'll mention that. I'll summarise at the end of what, what the guidance is. But basically, in a word, all pregnant women and most children should be getting vitamin D supplements or fortified food. 
The National Osteoporosis Society published their adult guidance two years ago, and the children's guidance is out for consultation at the moment. It will be published very soon. This was the adult guidance, which has been very helpful for adults. There will be something similar for children. It's a simple guide, mainly for doctors, telling us how to interpret the blood tests, how much vitamin D to prescribe for different adults. And the children's guidance should be out within a few months. Second, this is the government committee. This is a, a snapshot of their website last year. They have been reviewing the nation's nutrition for decades. In fact, previously the committee was called Coma, now it's called Sacken. This is the most important committee in the country. They've been focused on vitamin D for about four years now. It's top of their agenda. But unfortunately, their report keeps on being delayed and delayed. So I've been at major national and international meetings where the representatives of SACEN announced last year that the report would be issued before the summer, then it was going to be issued in the autumn. It was definitely going to come out before Christmas. If you look at the website at the moment, you'll see that the latest meeting said it will be issued in March. I heard yesterday that it's not going to come out before the election. I don't know why, but it's a political um, <clears throat> our children's health, unfortunately, is a political matter. I'll just say something now about the explosions. The explosion in scientific research has been going on for many years. When I qualified in medical school in the 1980s, there were about 500 papers published each year to do a vitamin D. It's now, this year, probably going to hit 5,000 papers. So the amount of scientific data coming out is overwhelming. Some of it excellent, some of it rubbish. And you'll read a lot of this in the newspaper. Almost every day in the newspaper, you'll see an article about vitamin D. On Saturday, the news from the Copenhagen study was that it's bad for you. It may increase the risk of strokes. Generally, most of the evidence coming out says it's good for you. So this is one of the um, explosions. The next explosion I want to mention is the retail explosion. Oh, sorry, I just want to give you an example of the sort of research emerging. This was published only a few days ago, on the 4th of March. This, I think, is a really valuable study, showing um, in blue on the bottom vitamin D blood levels over three years, 2007, 8, 9, and on top, another hormone called parathyroid hormone, PTH for short. PTH works with vitamin D to control your blood level of calcium. And these two things, we've always known they work together, but nobody's ever shown so nicely how as your vitamin D level goes up, your PTH level comes down. And it's, it reaches, the vitamin D reaches a peak at the end of the summer, around September. Can you see that at the end? And then, <coughs> Over the winter, it goes down January, February, March. And right now we're in March, and we are, at, we are at our lowest level of vitamin D. We've always known that, but what we didn't know is that the whole population have a rise in their PTH. That helps us understand what vitamin D is doing in the body, and that helps us work out what a healthy level of vitamin D is, because it is not healthy for your PTH to go too high. And I mentioned before there's controversy about what the ideal blood level of vitamin D is. There isn't any controversy about PTH though. We understand PTH much better. The normal range of PTH is really quite narrow. And it is very concerning that people's PTH rises when the vitamin D goes down. So this is one study which I think will help us set the national policy to tell us how much vitamin D we should give people. I'll leave the science now and just mention the retail market. And this is just one, also one recently published paper predicting that the global vitamin D supplement market will reach $59 billion by 2020. So there's a lot of money in vitamin D. The NHS, for instance, spends a lot of money dispensing vitamin D. 
public spend even more money buying supplements. It's a major industry. Finally, I want to talk about an explosion in rickets. Explosion may be slightly exaggerating, but there's certainly been an increase in rickets. This is a good study published in The Lancet last year, showing three different ways of measuring rickets, but whichever way you look at it, it has gone up in recent years. So, again, when I trained in medical school in the 80s, rickets was on the way down, and I was taught that rickets is a disease of the past, very much like TB, and I wasn't taught much about it. I didn't think I would see a case of rickets. I didn't think I'd need to know how to diagnose or treat rickets. And in fact, for the first 10 years after I qualified, I think I only saw one case. In the last 10 years, I'm seeing a lot of rickets, partly because I have a big interest in it, but most pediatricians will tell you that they're seeing cases of rickets now, and they never used to, and the data supports that. I'll show you one or two cases of rickets myself now. This is a, a boy whose legs don't look too bad, but he does actually have rickets. His legs are bowed, they're bent, because his bones are weak. His bones are weak because he's lacking vitamin D, and in fact, also lacking calcium in his diet. Can I briefly just mention this word orthopedics then? What does orthopedics mean? Anybody want to volunteer? I've heard some bones, and absolutely nowadays orthopedics means bone surgeons or bone surgery. Bone, it's all about bones. And I work at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital. But it's, the word in Latin is similar to this word. And ped means a child, iatric is medicine. Ortho means straight, ped still means a child. And orthopedics just means straight child. And when the term was invented a couple of years ago, it was because we, children who were not straight, the surgeons used, used to make them straight. And the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital, the original logo, which is still on our hospital, says for the cure of crippled children. Crippled just means not straight. We don't like the word crippled, but the truth is it just means not straight. We don't like the word to be stripped it out of our logo. That's the current logo that we're using. I'm on a campaign to eradicate rickets, and I think if you don't like the word crippled, how come people don't mind saying the word Rickets. Rickets really should not occur in this day and age. It's easy to prevent. And that's what I'm hoping you'll take forward um, after I've finished talking in another five minutes or so. One reason why they didn't get so much rickets was in the old days. This is my hospital. This, I was there yesterday. That's one of the wards. Most hospitals have pictures like this. They used to take patients outside in the sun. But you don't see this nowadays. I just want to quickly show you a child from the clinic that I saw two weeks ago. He's actually quite a happy child. Often they're very miserable with rickets. And I think if he hadn't been diagnosed at this point, he's only just over one year old. If he'd been left for another few months, he would have had a lot more pain and misery and <coughs> deformity. And I think you'll agree his legs are really not good. He had a low level of vitamin D, his blood level was 8. We often see children with a much lower level who are fine. But the reason why he's got rickets is he also has not enough calcium in his diet. And you really need a bit of both to be healthy. If you have a low vitamin D and a low level of calcium, you can get severe rickets like that. This is an x-ray, this is a normal wrist, and that shows the rotten ends of the bones if you don't have enough vitamin D. I just want to briefly mention <coughs> one useful thing that I think our vitamin D mission um, has set up is a website, vitamindmission.co.uk, and it's got this calculator on it, which is very easy to use, um, and allows parents to work out how much vitamin D their child is getting in their diet and from supplements, and gives them advice about how to increase that if necessary. So the bottom line, my last question was, how, who needs vitamin D and exactly how much and how often? There are some knowns and some unknowns. Um, the, the definite known facts, in this country, 
the two national recommendations are that all pregnant and all breastfeeding mothers should be getting 400 units of vitamin D every day. Sometimes the, the um, dietitians might, instead of talking about 400 units, might use the term 10 micrograms. It's the same thing. All children from the age of six months to five years should be getting about 300 units or seven and a half micrograms <coughs> per day. So those have been national guidelines for more than 10 years now. Only very few people know about it. Very few of us health professionals knew about it. And very few of the mothers know about it. I've been asking parents for at least four years now, every child I see, whenever I see them for, I ask them, are you taking vitamins, are you giving your child vitamins? And most parents are surprised when I ask them and tell them that they should be. Most frequently, they say, well, my child has a good diet. Well, that's great for all your vitamins except for vitamin D. If you live in this country and you haven't been abroad for the last few years, you'll, you'll have a low level of vitamin D now, unless you're taking a supplement or a fortified food. So that's the national guidance. Who else needs vitamin D? Well, who knows? Maybe we should all be taking it. Maybe every adult, maybe every older child. One thing that the pediatricians are campaigning for, though, is that younger children, we're not happy that the national guidance starts at six months. No other country says that. Generally, they start from birth. It's much easier to start from birth. There's no reason not to start from birth. And we are hoping that SACEN, for instance, the government committee, in their report, might change that guidance. The main national health um, service effort to solve the problem has been the Healthy Start Vitamins, which have not been as successful as we hoped. So we're hoping this year there'll be much better national provision. In conclusion, I think we, as health professionals, need to, need to focus on three things to improve our children's vitamin D nutrition. Number one, increase awareness amongst the the families, the mothers and, and, and the parents, and the, the teachers who look after our children. Number two, I think we as professionals need to particularly focus on families at high risk. Immigrant families, people who don't speak English, people with darker skin need to be aware that you would struggle to get enough vitamin D in this country if you have dark skin. And generally we need to encourage people to get more vitamin D, either as supplements in the forms of drops or spray or tablets or by drinking or eating fortified foods.